August 24th, 1980, the day of the Talladega IndyCar race. Drivers were expected to hit speeds of 225 miles per hour, nearly 30 miles an hour faster than at Indianapolis. But the track was empty that day. There were no cars, there were no fans. The race was canceled. Following another video earlier in this series about USAC cars running at Daytona, this story may sound ludicrous, but actually for a time it appeared that Indy cars were going to run at the world's fastest track. This was brought about by a split in open wheel racing. IndyCar was fractured between opposing sides of USAC and CART. Its competitors and events were torn in two, and all logic was thrown asunder. While the open wheel split is most often discussed in the context of the 1990s, it actually began back in the mid-1970s and was related to rising costs. Beginning in 1976, better funded teams began using Cosworth engines. This shifted away from the Offenhauser engines that had been used for decades. The Cosworth was more powerful than the Offie, but cost nearly $35,000 each. The new cost threatened to run smaller teams out of business. It's a question of the haves versus the have-nots. The haves have the Cosworth V8s, the have-nots have the venerable old Offenhauser four-cylinder engines. There, that contingent is unhappy. The uh, United States Auto Club uh, Competition Committee is making some attempt to equalize the competition, but at this point, uh, things are not uh, all sweetness and light down here in the pits. To equalize the different engines, USAC implemented pop-off valves to regulate turbocharger boost. The rules concerning these valves were changed constantly, angering team owners. Four-cylinder versus eight-cylinder, and it's really boiled over here. The anger came out in the qualifying today. The four-cylinders electing to run at about 75 miles an hour. The eight-cylinders running at uh, a full bore of over 200 miles per hour. Dan, tell us just a bit about it. Well, it's a real modern-day protest. It, uh, it, it amounts to complaining about the fact that they, everyone during qualification must carry a, a boost limiting device. And it seems to penalize the four-cylinder cars more than the eights. The four-cylinder boys feel that they just don't have a chance in qualifying and they're trying to get attention to that problem. Things went from bad to worse in October 1977 when Indianapolis Motor Speedway owner Tony Holman died at the age of 76. Arguably the most important man in IndyCar, his passing created a void in the sports leadership. As the 78 season began, crowds were shrinking, purse sizes were lackluster, and the team owners were unhappy. The problems in IndyCar racing were made worse on April 23, 1978. Flying back from a race in Trenton, New Jersey, 10 high-ranking USEC executives and officials were killed in a plane crash. The loss further complicated IndyCar leadership. Around that time, Dan Gurney sent a memo to other car owners calling for them to unite and demand changes in IndyCar. Drawing inspiration from the Formula One Constructors Association, Gurney, Roger Penske, and Pat Patrick led a group that created Championship Auto Racing Teams, or CART, an advocacy group of car owners that would help negotiate higher purses and improvements to IndyCar racing. In late 1978, they sent a list of demands to USAC. When USAC rejected these demands on November 18th, the car owners left to create their own IndyCar series in a partnership with the SCCA. Now the team owners would be able to create their own rules as they saw fit. Almost all of the major teams in IndyCar racing joined the new kart series. About the only big name to stay in USAC was AJ Foyt. Tensions ran deep between the two groups. USAC viewed CART as a group of rebel team owners who wanted to make the rules for a series they raced in. CART viewed USAC as an out-of-touch organization that didn't understand what teams were going through. When the 1979 season began, CART banned their teams from running in any USAC races other than the Indy 500.
While there were two different IndyCar series in 1979, USAC still sanctioned the Indy 500 and used this to punish the Rebel teams of CART. As CART was racing in Atlanta in late April, USAC notified six team owners on the CART board of directors that they wouldn't be allowed to enter the Indy 500. They were, quote, not in good standing with USAC. In response, the CART teams filed a lawsuit in U.S. District Court to allow them to compete in Indianapolis. They claimed that all entries had to be accepted or federal antitrust laws would be violated. As the court battle was ready to begin, USAC found an ally in NASCAR, who was equally appalled by the prospect of a group of team owners having control of a series. If CART drivers couldn't race at Indianapolis, NASCAR and the Charlotte Motor Speedway insisted they also wouldn't be welcome to run the World 600. On May 3rd, the CART teams met in an Indianapolis courtroom. After a three-day hearing, a judge issued a temporary injunction ordering USAC to accept the CART teams. It was ruled that the effect on the drivers was too severe. In response, USAC changed the Indy 500 to an invitation-only event beginning in 1980, giving them the legal right to exclude whoever they wanted. Well, the annual exciting feeling is here. And I'm glad of that because for much of this month, we weren't really sure. In fact, when we first came here early in the month, there was nothing but controversy and litigation. For a while, they weren't really sure that there would actually be a 500-mile race in 1979. Two groups called USAC and CART were fighting and wrestling for control and domination of this kind of motorsport in the United States. Well, they finally reached an armed truce. But again, the winner, Rick Spears of Bakersfield, California, in the Penske Cosworth car number nine. From Pocono International Raceway in Pocono, Pennsylvania, this is the MRN Broadcasting Company with coverage of the Pocono USAC Music 500. And in the center, Danny Ongayas from Costa Mesa, California, starts from position number two in the Interscope Panasonic Parnelli Cosworth. And what a qualifying run for this gentleman. He felt like he would win the pole, but such was not to be because A.J. Foyt of Houston, Texas, planked his machine solidly on the pole, the Gilmore Racing Team Parnelli Cosworth. The season is now seven races old. Today's being number eight. Rather than make racing better, the split has unfortunately made it worse. The most notable result of the split, besides short fields, is a sharp decline in spectator attendance and the drop in the number of races shown on television. The hard-headed stance by those in power on both sides leads this observer to say that when it's all over, the winner, if there is one, will have no spoils of war to take home. As 1979 went on, USAC and CART continued to fight. In early July, a 500-mile Labor Day weekend race at Ontario Motor Speedway switched from a USAC to a CART event. USAC responded by attempting to schedule a second race in Indianapolis for that weekend. The series met with track chairman Mary Holman George and A.J. Foyt even offered to rent the Speedway himself. USAC suggested running a double header of races, a 250-mile USAC stock car race on Saturday and a 250-mile Indy car race on Sunday. The last time Indianapolis held a race other than the Indy 500 was in 1916. The idea was quickly dismissed by the Speedway in the name of tradition. In late August, Pocono International Raceway filed a lawsuit against CART seeking over $6 million in damages. Claiming antitrust violations, they argued that CART banned their drivers from running in the Pocono USAC race. The only CART driver who did race was Danny Ungaius, and he was fined $5,000 by CART for doing so. Without the big stars, attendance was terrible, the track lost millions of dollars, and the race's title sponsor left after one year. This put Pocono in such financial trouble that the track nearly went into foreclosure. At the last minute, Indianapolis Motor Speedway agreed to lease the track and promote its races in 1980, and this alone saved the Speedway. The lawsuit moved slowly for the next two years. As Rick Mears and A.J. Foyt won the CART and USAC championships respectively, both series fought over tracks as they made their 1980 schedules. CART was first to strike, releasing their schedule in late October. USAC had more trouble getting races. When their schedule was released shortly after Christmas, there were several new events. USAC would make their first appearances at Mid-Ohio and Road Atlanta. And getting help from their NASCAR allies, USAC scheduled 500 kilometer races at Charlotte and at Talladega. 
In August 1974, A.J. Foyt set a closed course speed record at Talladega driving his IndyCar with the fastest lap of 217.854 miles per hour. USAC's rules limiting turbochargers meant the speeds in 1979 were similar to the speeds in 1974. It was estimated the pole speed at Talladega would be between 220 and 225 miles per hour. The speeds were a definite concern. In 1959, IndyCars raced at Daytona, the event marred by the death of driver George Amick. IndyCars never returned to a NASCAR super speedway after that, but Talladega was convinced the race would be safe because a recent repave had made the track perfectly smooth. Still hoping for a reunification, everyone realized that having two rival series was terrible for IndyCar racing. After a year of fighting, new Indianapolis Motor Speedway President John Cooper led the peace talks between USAC and CART. In early April, the two series came to an agreement, and once again merged into one series, the Championship Racing League. The new series set a goal of creating a governing structure, and a rules package by the 1st of July. The CRL schedule was a combination of events from USAC and CART. In response to the news of a merger, Talladega canceled the IndyCar race, concerned that any rules changes would result in faster speeds. But the CRL only lasted a few months. In mid-June, John Cooper made the shocking announcement that the CRL would not be eligible to sanction the Indy 500 in 1981, and the track would look for a new sanctioning body. But the new CRL board of directors was nearly the same as CART, with too many car owners leading the series. Cooper felt it was that same terrible conflict of interest for team owners to make the rules of a series. He wanted a seven-person board with no more than three car owners. Cooper called for all major racing series in the United States to make proposals to sanction the Indy 500 in 1981. USAC immediately withdrew from the CRL agreement and tried to reclaim the Indy 500. This opened the floodgates as NASCAR, IMSA, SCCA, and even the National Hot Rod Association all attempted to earn the right to sanction the Indy 500. Ironically, the NHRA for a while appeared to be the most likely host of the next Indy 500 since they owned the nearby Indianapolis Raceway Park. Meanwhile, CART moved forward with the 1980 season, continuing to run the CRL schedule and also adding more races that were on the original CART schedule. USAC was unable to reschedule any of their races, and their season ended abruptly in July. To convince Indianapolis that they were completely independent, USAC changed their board of directors to a six-person group that had no ties to any of the participants. On August 29th, it was announced that USAC would sanction the Indy 500 in 1981. By that point, most tracks were aligned with CART. For 1981, USAC would only sanction two IndyCar races, the Indy 500 and a June 21st race at the Pocono track they bailed out years earlier. All CART teams entered the Indy 500, won by Team Penske's Bobby Unser. Unlike in Indianapolis, CART banned their competitors from racing at Pocono. The event at Pocono had so few entries that dirt cars were allowed to race just to have a larger field. And it was against this unfortunate backdrop that A.J. Foyt earned his final IndyCar victory. Tom Sneva and Dick Simon were the only major kart drivers to race in defiance of the ban. In the aftermath of Pocono, Sneva, Simon, and five other drivers were suspended by kart for 60 days. Sneva and Simon filed a lawsuit against CART in a U.S. district court, claiming that the ban violated federal antitrust laws. After both drivers missed one race, a judge issued a restraining order overturning the suspensions. While his 1979 lawsuit was still pending, Pocono track owner Joe Mattioli was again hurt by a disastrous race because of a CART boycott. After claiming the attendance was only one-third of what it usually was, Pocono sued CART for $9 million this time. The track received a substantial but confidential settlement in 1982. The Pocono fight was the final battle between USAC and CART. For the next 15 years, CART dominated IndyCar racing, while USAC just sanctioned the Indy 500. IndyCar would be split once again in 1996 when the Indy Racing League was formed. 
This time, the two series fought for over 10 years.